Can you hear me? There you go. <laughs> Got it. Thank you so much, Sharon. So my name is Dr. Diana Zitzerman. I'm a board certified and licensed acupuncturist and also naturopathic physician. And I'm really excited here today because we're going to talk about how to feel well post-COVID. So if you're joining now or in the upcoming minutes, please just feel free to join. And if you have any questions, I'd like to wait until the end of the presentation, uh, just so that I can get through most of my information. All right, I'm gonna share my screen now. I don't know if this is working here right now. My apologies. Do you want to send it to me, Diana, and I can try to pull it up? Sure, sure. I'm so sorry. I am using a new computer and it's not. All right, let me let me do this. My apologies. Okay, everybody. So Dr. Diana is coming into my office and and she is going to be presenting from here. Here we go. Thank you, Sharon. And thank you everyone for being so patient with us. And okay, so I'm going to reintroduce myself. My name is Dr. Diana Zitterman. I'm a board certified naturopathic physician and also licensed acupuncturist here at Mandel JCC, offering a wide variety of holistic health options. So today's presentation is going to be all about feeling well post-COVID. Post-COVID, also called long haul COVID, and in some inferences, we'll also see it as post-acute COVID, long-term COVID, or chronic COVID. What this essentially is, based in, on the CDC guidelines, is that it's any kind of condition that's post-COVID related with a wide range of new, returning, or ongoing health problems that people can experience for four or more weeks after first being infected with the virus that causes COVID-19. Data suggests that more than one in three people end up with long COVID, and the symptoms can actually linger three to six months after illness. What kind of symptoms, you ask? Well, there are a wide range of symptoms, anywhere from difficulty breathing and shortness of breath, tiredness, fatigue, post-exertional malaise, difficulty thinking and concentrating. People will report to have this brain fog that won't go away, a cough or chest pain, stomach pain, headache, heart palpitations, any kind of joint or muscle pain, pins and needles feeling or neuropathy, diarrhea, sleep problems, a fever that can, can come on so suddenly, any kind of dizziness or lightheadedness, even a rash or mood changes, and a continued sense of change of smell or taste and changes in the menstrual cycle. The COVID-19 virus can also affect multi-organs. And there is a small subset of individuals that can actually encounter this type of inflammatory syndrome. What happens is that multiple body parts can become inflamed during the COVID-19 virus. Most of the time, there's a predominance in heart conditions and also GI conditions. It can also affect our children. So this multi-system inflammatory syndrome, abbreviated as MISC for children, can account for many of the new cases that are being published. 
However, based on tracking through the data tracking systems from the CDC, MIS is rare and it does follow specific diagnostic guidelines. In Connecticut, it's been reported to have less than 100 pediatric cases and statistical data is showing that the average age of, of a youngster is about nine years old and 60% of them are male. So this multi-system inflammatory syndrome can affect multiple organs from your eyes to your lips, to your lymph nodes, maybe a possible skin rash. You might have some neurological changes to your mind function and behavior. Some, some of times individuals are also experiencing this fever. And like I mentioned earlier, any kind of chest complaints and also digestive issues. So how do we manage this long COVID? Well, the first part could be testing your markers of inflammation and even key vitamins and minerals that are important for tissue repair. Certain markers of inflammation that I like to test are C-reactive protein and the SED rate, ESR. Vitamin D3 is really critical for your immunity, so it's good to keep up track to see how much of your level is. Vitamin B12 and folate are really important for DNA repair and detoxification pathways. Zinc is also key in DNA repair and tissue repair. And zinc and magnesium when testing, it's most best to do so in the red blood cell rather than just in plain serum. It gives a more accurate result. Iron levels are really important also to find out. This is to, to address if there's any underlying anemia. And omega-3 fatty acids. These are key anti-inflammatory fats that can help our tissues to repair and recover, but also to downregulate any kind of inflammation signal. We'll talk about them in a little bit. Other ways of managing long COVID could be to incorporate new ways of managing and reducing stress. Stress is happening in our lives constantly from internal stress, physical stress, chemical stress, negative self-talk stress, stresses that we can't really, you know, think about or, you know, control. So we have to find ways how to impact our daily life habits to reduce these stress. And we'll talk about some great stress reducing techniques. Changing your diet to a more anti-inflammatory diet is key. The foods you eat is contributing to either anti-inflammatory effects or pro-inflammatory effects. And if your body is already going through symptoms of long COVID and possible inflammation elevation, we want to do our best to improve our nutrition by inducing more anti-inflammatory actions. Considering acupuncture for symptom management. This is really, really fun for me because I'm an acupuncturist and we treat these types of symptoms related to COVID all the time. And it depends on the individual's health history, their tongue, their pulse, and just a symptom picture. And so creating some kind of balance to move chi and to remove any kind of blocked or stagnant chi would be key in symptom management. Another part of managing COVID is just following the CDC guidelines. And most of us are doing a pretty good job in that because we have to make the best decision for self-protection and our own families. And lastly, seeking the proper guidance is key. Outside of your primary care physicians or any kind of specialist that you are utilizing to manage your symptoms, mental health specialists are key players in this stress management role that COVID can play. Naturopathic physicians, including myself, are also really big key players because they help to balance the integrative part of conventional medicine and the alternative medicine. And lastly, health coaches. Health coaches are huge in this, in this portion of long COVID management because a lot of times we don't really even know how to start with changing and managing our symptoms and a health coach can definitely guide you in the right direction. So the CDC does a really great job in describing ways to cope with stress. And this is coming directly from the website. The CDC says that taking breaks from watching, reading, or listening to news stories, including social media, is key. Obviously, hearing about the pandemic can be very upsetting. And just taking a break from that would be really, really important to reduce stress. 
taking care of your body. What does that look like? Taking deep breaths, stretching, meditation, practicing mindfulness, trying to eat a healthy, well-balanced meal, exercise if you can, because your body is always giving you signs. Maybe you have an ache in your neck or you have something going on in your ankle. Possible movement is important. Getting plenty of sleep and rest is key for tissue repair. And also they're recommending to avoid alcohol and drugs just because that these are stimulants and they can stimulate the, the liver detox pathways and also all of that kind of toxin overload that can be going through your bloodstream during an inflammatory response. Make time to unwind. If you are able to, try out some new activities that you're going to enjoy, like walking a mile or getting a massage, laughing with a friend, playing with animals or, or children that you have at home, or maybe you could borrow some from your neighbors or your family members. Starting a puzzle. I recently started a puzzle with my husband. It was pretty fun. Playing a game, cooking a new meal, even spending me time, tea time with a journal can be really helpful as a great way to unwind for the day. And lastly, connect with others. Talk with people you trust about your concerns and how you are feeling. It's really great to express yourself and get your feelings out. So here are some of my favorite stress reducing techniques, them of which I have done many. So the first one has to be exercise, walking, jogging. This includes any and every exercise that you can move your body to. Running, interval training, yoga, tai chi, weight training, dancing, swimming, any kind of sport that you have an interest in, anything to physically move your body can greatly reduce stress levels. Guided meditation or breathing exercises. If you haven't tried some, please try at home. There's free YouTube videos. Prayer and positive affirmation to help you manifest what you want in your health. Emotional freedom technique or something called tapping solution is where we tap onto certain points located on our face, our shoulder, our hand, and even right near our rib cage. There's nine points. That they follow very closely to acupuncture points. And at times of stress or anxiety, the tapping solution has been found to be pretty effective in lowering stress levels. Trying out some journaling or gratitude journaling. This is where you jot down five things that you are grateful for each morning. And this can change your perspective of how you envision your life and your stressors. Read a new book. One of my patients recommended Rewire Your Anxious Brain. And I recommended Heal Your Body by Louise Hay. So there's tons of books out there for self-healing, self-care, self-recovery, and getting your mind into the idea of new words, newfound ideas of how to reduce your stress is going to be key. If you like to take a bath, take an Epsom salt bath. This is magnesium sulfite or sulfate, excuse me, to relax those muscles and those nerves and relieve that tension. A lot of times with stress, we feel tense bodies, tense muscles. It's a really great time to enjoy that bath. Sing your heart out. For those who love to sing, whether it is to yourself, to in a choir, a virtual choir, or even to your children, sing it out. Because that can definitely reduce your stress hormones and increase those wonderful endorphins to help you heal your tissue. Playing with a pet or a child, even hearing babies laugh. It has a very special, special place in my heart. <laughs> and it can definitely reduce stress levels in a very instant moment. Finding a new hobby. Here's one way to find a new hobby. You write out a hobby bucket list and then you try each one, one by one for 21 days. And if you like it, you adopt it. And if you don't, you can discard it and move on to your next option on your bucket list. Finding a new hobby gets your mind out of the stressful routine and it allows you to explore and create new avenues of de-stressing. Transform Negative Thinking with 30 Minutes of Power Thoughts by Louise Hay. This is a free YouTube recording by Louise Hay. She does a wonderful job to change your perspective of negative thinking. Another 
important idea is to turn needs into preferences. We have to realize that our basic physical needs really translate into food, water, air, and keeping warm, especially in the winter time. Everything else is a preference. So try not to get attached to preferences. And lastly, changing your pace on weekends. If you're having a slow week at work or, or anything that you are doing during the week, be active during the weekend and vice versa. If you're really having an active and productive week, then slow down during the weekend. Have a little bit more balance between your days. That will offer a great way to de-stress. When it comes to nutrition, eating anti-inflammatory is the key. So what kind of foods cause inflammation? We may have heard of them many, many times. And we sometimes need to hear it over and over again to remind ourselves that there are great options to fight inflammation. So foods that are processed, that are considered junk foods, red meat, extra sugar, added sugars, white breads and pastas, and any kind of preservative or artificial ingredient, unhealthy oils, these are all considered in inducers of inflammation. And so an anti-inflammatory diet is where you eliminate those foods, even for a particular period of time, and you aim for more whole foods, the fruits, the vegetables, the herbs, the spices, they have a lot of medicinal health benefits. Fatty fish uh, from salmon and tuna, but also nuts and seeds and their oils are great for anti-inflammation. And even dark chocolate. Why not <laughs> enjoy some dark chocolate for its health benefits? Great way to fight inflammation. Another way to eat anti-inflammatory is considering a special diet outside of anti-inflammatory diet, something like a challenge, like a 30-day challenge that comes from the Whole30 diet. This is a specific diet that has been shown to reduce inflammation, reduce weight, reduce aches, reduce pains, and many individuals have reported really positive effects. So the rules to this Whole30 diet is to avoid grains, dairy, legumes, any refined or added sugars, alcohol, and preservatives and foods like carrageenan and sulfites for 30 days at least. And then see how you feel. The last anti-inflammatory eating guide that I can give is something called the elimination diet. And this is a very much more individualized approach where one can actually um, find out if they have any kind of food sensitive reactions. So there's two ways of going about this here in Mandel JCC. We could order Quest Labs, and this is what some uh, panel that's called Food Allergy IgG panel, and it can test for 11 commonly eaten foods. Those are the heavy hitter foods like wheat, dairy, corn, peanuts, soy, cocoa, coffee, tomato, cod, and yeast. And if we want to take a step further and take a more deeper dive into food intolerances, we could opt into a more specialized lab test. One, as an example, would be US Biotech Company. And this one can test for 96 commonly eaten foods. And all you need to do is just prick your finger and it will saturate this card that then will be submitted to the company itself. And what you get back is a really easy to read sample report of what kind of foods you might have a sensitivity to. This information from, comes from Bastyr Center for Natural Health. And Bastyr University is one of our sister schools that teaches naturopathic physicians the art of naturopathy. And so they do a really great job to designing and explaining what a healthy plate looks like. And what you can see here is that it includes fruits, vegetables, digestives, healthy fats, proteins, and whole grains and starches. So we're not necessarily excluding any of the macronutrients, but we're doing more so including the healthier options that are going to give us these anti-inflammatory effects. And we can't forget the glass of water after your meal. 
So for whole grains and starches, the idea here is to add high fiber whole grains and to add starchy vegetables that have a lot of vitamins and minerals, something like sweet potatoes and squash. Limiting refined grains would be key when you're following an anti-inflammatory diet. Proteins, we would want a, a wide variety of proteins from fish and poultry, eggs and some dairy. Obviously choosing options that are organic, free range and grass fed when possible are key. And adding a lot more um, proteins that come from plants would be ideal just because they have less inflammatory molecules. Looking at healthy fats, considering a, a healthy plate, we want to increase our healthy fats. Those are foods like avocados, nuts and seeds, fatty fish, nut butters and their oils. We want to aim for cold pressed oils and any kind of dressings and marinades made from olive oil are great. And using coconut oil uh, for baking and cooking would be awesome. And then adding digestives. Digestives are the idea of prebiotic and probiotic molecules that help our digestive gut. So it helps to build and replenish our good bacteria called the normal flora. And most of our immune system is actually located in the gut. So helping to eat fermented foods like sauerkraut, yogurt that has probiotics, miso soup, tempeh, kimchi, apple cider vinegar, kombucha tea, kefir, and other fermented vegetables can be really helpful for the immune system. Vegetables, fill up your plate. Ideally, we want to see at least a half of your plate with some raw vegetables and some cooked vegetables. And, you know, the more vegetables, the better, the more colorful, the better. And choosing at least one green vegetable and another color vegetable with every meal would be ideal. However, if you are doing any form of smoothie, you can always mix your vegetables in there and hide them so that you're getting those servings. It is recommended between five to seven servings of fruits and vegetables are anti-inflammatory. And lastly, fruits. They make for a really great healthy dessert choice, but they're also great in fiber and key nutrients that we'll talk about. One of them is quercetin that can help with long-term COVID. The fruits and vegetables are the key. So eating well and balanced. This picture is a really great idea of what a balanced plate would look like. You have your whole grains and your seeds and your nuts, followed by some vegetables, an avocado that has healthy fats. And I believe those are scrambled eggs. Right? Is it cheesy? I'm not even sure. Any case, if we aim for, you know, substituting these types of meals and making these meals into snacks, small portions, we can really gain a lot of great health outcomes. <clears throat> Some of which will be higher energy levels, better sleep, less bloating, positive and stable mood, healthy glowing skin, a faster metabolism, disease prevention, habitual healthy eating, learning how to eat healthy and also a faster recovery, all of which health outcomes would be excellent when we deal with long-term COVID. Now, acupuncture is a really great way to manage symptoms. And although research studies are not as robust just because COVID has only been around for two years, there have been some studies that came from Harvard University in 2020 that found that acupuncture actually reduced the impact of cytokine production in mice. Another study in 2021 from Oxford University found that acupuncture treatment for COVID-19 suppressed the inflammation caused by stress, which helped to improve immunity and regulate the nervous system and it even helped cancer patients with COVID-19. Just a disclaimer, acupuncture cannot kill the virus, but it can regulate the immune system and inhibit inflammation. So how does it work? Well, you see here, there's an acupuncture needle, the acupuncturist is touching the handle and the needle pierces through the skin. 
as the, as the piercing is happening, there's a stimulation of an acupuncture point and it's causing the release of nervous system chemicals to our brain, in our spinal cord and our muscles. And what is actually producing these chemicals are helping the body to actually heal naturally. It can heal, it can speed up the healing process and even alter your perception of pain. And so this, this is a really great mechanism to not only um, feel the deeper state of calm or relaxation, but it can reduce pain and it can also improve your sense of hope and well being. It's a safe and effective drug free therapy that can help address a wide range of ailments. And I strongly recommend someone trying acupuncture. So here's a little fun thing for everyone, acupressure at home. So if you can't come to the office, you can try applying some pressure to these acupuncture points at home. And I've hand selected three, and I'll tell you each specific reason as to why. So points to improve energy altogether when dealing with post COVID should come from digestion, kidney or adrenal function, and the lung and the chest functions. So the master points of chi for your vital energy would include a point called REN17, we'll get to it. It's the influential point of chi, the chi that moves in the chest. So if you're having any kind of shortness of breath, chest pain, uh, heart, you know, heart palpitations, heart pain, or even acid reflux or bird, this is a really great point to put pressure on. Kidney three is located near your inner ankle. And this is the source point of the kidney chi that gives you lots of energy. And then the stomach 36 point is a major tonifying chi point that is really helpful for digestion. And it also is translated to treating 100 diseases. So let's begin. REN17, if you find your nipples and you meet in the very center or the sternum, in the fourth intercostal space down, you'll find a very tender point. And this is called REN17. If it's tender, you might need to apply pressure to it. So this influential point helps with asthma, cough, shortness of breath, any kind of pain or oppressive feeling on the chest, heart palpitations, anxiety can also be prevented by applying pressure to this point. And if, if you are a nursing mother, it can help with lactation and any kind of hiccups or difficulty swallowing. Give this point a try. The next one is kidney three. It has a lot of great functions. It's the Yuan source point of the kidney channel. And so where you find this point is in a depression between the inner ankle bone and the inner portion of the Achilles tendon as it, as it attaches to the calcaneal bone. So if you can find that depression, it's really significant. You can actually feel it with your finger. If it's tender, it's a great point to apply pressure to, but even when you're applying pressure and it feels better, then most likely you have a sign of chi deficiency. So applying pressure to the kidney three point would, would help you to generate more kidney chi in this point. It helps with back pain, weak knees, deafness, ringing in the ears called tinnitus. It can also help with a headache or dizziness, blurred vision, toothache, and even sometimes soreness of the throat, swelling of the pharynx. It can help with cough and asthma and even helps with energy in those with diabetes and it can help with sleep, incontinence, and even fertility issues. So give this point a try. It's a really great point to apply pressure to if you can't get yourself over to an acupuncturist to needle it. The last point that I'd like to introduce you to is stomach 36. So if you bend your knee, everybody knows that they have like a, a patella, right? A knee, knee bone. And if you bend your knee slightly, you'll find two little um, depressions called the eyes of the knee. We pretend they're right here, one and two, eyes of the knee, right? Great. With your four finger breaths together, you go to the most outward eye and you place your hands, these four finger breaths called three soon, three soon, down the shin bone on the outside portion of your tibia. 
and it's one finger breadth away from the tibia bone, we, and you have to head out to the outside portion, so the lateral portion. That's right, Sharon, she's doing this right here, right now, yes. And so like right at the end of your pinky, yes, correct, that's where the point is, stomach 36. And this point helps to treat all digestive issues. It helps to tonify your chi or increase your energy that comes from your digestive tract. It can also help with just general chi deficiency if you're feeling shortness of breath or heart palpitations, poor appetite, just fatigue and tiredness. It can also help with a cough and asthma. It can help with pain, pain in the knee, or even edema, edema of the leg or the ankle. And it can also help with depression or psychosis. And so this point is a really big point because many acupuncturists utilize this point. It maintains overall health. So it's a really big point to apply pressure to. So part of COVID is to control this inflammation, right? As we talked about. And why is this inflammation happening? What is circulating in our body that's creating this inflammation? And it's all due to this idea of these pro-inflammatory molecules called cytokines that our body's tissues and our cells are constantly being produced. And so controlling the cytokine circus is a really interesting uh, term because it stemmed from the 20 in uh, December of 2020, where you know, COVID was just unraveling and a research article was published and it stated cytokine circus with a viral ringleader. That's kind of how it felt, you know, in the early stages of, of COVID discovery. However, we do know a lot more information given now. And the idea of reducing inflammation by controlling cell pathways um, and the production and release of these cytokines are key. So when it comes to natural remedies, we want to mimic the natural response that plants and nutrients have to actually decreasing cytokines. And so as you can see here in this depiction, um, this is just a brief explanation. Say the SARS-CoV virus goes and attaches to your cell and this starts the cascade of your immune cells coming forward and then releasing cytokines. And chemokines are basically molecules that attract other types of cells and molecules to the site of inflammation. And so there's what's called the cytokine storm where, where it's just way too many molecules all happening at once, creating this dysfunction in your immune system, which can lead to inflammation and tissue injury. And the three well-known cell pathways are the NF, NF kappa beta pathway, which is related to inflammation, JAK-STAT pathway, and MAP kinase. And we won't talk about those very scientific terms, but this is just the literature of how it's solidified and what we can do about it naturally. So turns out there are a lot of natural immunosuppressant compounds out there, like curcumin and luteolin, and pepperin from black pepper, and resveratrol from the skins of grapes and even wine. So these are well-documented chemical compounds that come from natural sources that have been shown to inhibit the production and release of pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. Here's just an example of curcumin. Curcumin is a very well-studied natural anti-inflammatory. It's well-studied enough that it can treat atherosclerosis or cardiovascular disease, inflammatory bowel disease, arthritis. It's been used in the treatment of psoriasis and even in depression. And so as you can see in this schematic, there's a lot of different cytokines that are being influenced with the usage of curcuminoids. And even COVID-19 has been shown in some literature that curcumin can suppress the production of these cytokines. This is wonderful. So nature's immunosuppressing chemicals, just a few to wet your palate with. Um, you may have heard of luteolin. It is a naturally occurring flavonoid or antioxidant that in 
most cases, if you've heard of it, you're probably dealing with some kind of like eye repair that can happen from nerve damage, macular degeneration, eye vision changes. Luteolin is an excellent flavonoid to help with repairing of the nervous tissue in your eye. And it can be found in many vegetables, including celery, parsley, broccoli, carrots, peppers, and cabbage. You can find it high in apple skin and even in a flower called chrysanthemum. In a human study where they incubated whole blood and they injected um, LPS, which is lipopolysaccharide, this is a form of bacterial wall. So they incubated human whole blood with basically a bacterial pathogen. And they found that luteolin was able to inhibit the production of certain cytokines. And also other literature has shown to have inhibitory effects on these inflammatory pathways. So a really great chemical to possibly introduce into your supplemental regimen. Quercetin is a wonderful molecule. It's a polyphenol type of flavonoid. It's actually fat soluble and it's found in a great abundance of vegetables. You're probably eating these vegetables on a daily or weekly basis from broccoli, red onions, eggplant, potato, green leafy vegetables, celery. It can be found high in apples and citrus fruit, red grapes and tomatoes, berries like cranberries and raspberries, and even capers. I found that out a couple of years ago. So I started adding capers to my fish meals <laughs> and also salads, they're very tasty. They have a good amount of quercetin, about 325 milligrams um, in a serving size. So that's pretty good. And so, oh, tomato sauce, very good, yes. <laughs> Thank you, good idea, yes. So quercetin has been found to decrease these pro-inflammatory cytokines, as well as chemokines in influenza A treated cell lines. And then when we look at resveratrol, resveratrol can be found in 70 or more different species of plants. And it's high in foods like grapes and berries, cranberry, blueberry, mulberry. You can find some in peanuts and jackfruit, soy and wine. It is a polyphenol antioxidant. It has been utilized in literature as an anti-cancer property, anti-inflammatory property, antiviral, and anti-aging. It's been shown in the literature to downregulate the NF-kappa beta pathway, and it's in, when it's revolved around in inflammation around the lungs. And it can also have an inhibitory effect on other cytokines that has been shown to be part of a rabbit model in an acute pharyngitis, like a common cold that affects your, your throat. Melatonin is another nature or natural immunosuppressing chemical. It can be found in many plants, a lot of herbs that we utilize, and it's also secreted by we humans, by our pineal gland in our brains. It, it, tends to be secreted highest at nine o'clock at night and in total darkness. So say someone is needing to supplement melatonin, um, I would recommend doing so earlier than 9 p.m. or at 9 p.m. and try to stay away from all that screen light because it can affect your ability to produce melatonin. It's a master sleep hormone. And as we know, sleep is a time that tissue repairs. So getting enough sleep and having enough of this hormone is key. And what it can help with in regards to anti-inflammation is it has been shown to decrease serum levels of potential uh, cytokines like IL-6, TNF-alpha, and IL-1-beta. So for botanical medicine, wearable medicine, that it has antiviral and immune modulating properties. We're looking at something like Andrographis, Scutellaria bicolensis, curcumin, magnolia, and also astragalus. You'll find these types of herbs really well used in anti-inflammatory or antiviral formulas. And Andrographis 
is a is a wonderful herb to start because it can actually help to regulate the production of natural killer cells. And so at times when you're first having your infection, these natural killer cells are being generated and the andrographis helps with that kind of production. It can also stimulate the production of cytotoxic cells that can kill the pathogen. So andrographis is a really great way to help stimulate your immune system. It can also inhibit those cytokines that we talked about that are inflammatory. And when we're looking at the next herb of Scutellaria bicolensis, now it does a little bit of a different spectrum of coronavirus, um, anti-coronavirus effects. It has been shown that the compound that's been extracted called bicalin can actually inhibit the protease in vitro. And this has been now a preferred target for broad spectrum drug discovery when it comes to coronavirus therapies. When we take a look at curcumin or turmeric, it has a wide range of literature that has been shown to be anti-inflammatory, to help reduce that cytokine storm, and to help regulate that NF-kappa beta pathways in multiple stages. And it can also positively regulate anti-inflammatory cytokines like IL-10. The next up is magnolia. Magnolia has this wonderful compound that gets extracted called honokiol. And it's been found to inhibit the production of NF-kappa beta inflammation that can also be related to carcinogenic properties. It can decrease uh, chemokines and uh, decrease the ability for cell adhesion to um, many pathogens. The next one is astragalus root. This is a Chinese herb that has been traditionally used to treat colds and flus. And it has a predilection for improving lung qi or chest qi. And some literature has shown that it can reduce mucosal damage that, um, can, that can occur uh, from the inflammatory cytokines. Here's an interesting supplement study that comes from Europe that was studying post-COVID individuals. Now it's a small pilot study, only 20 people. And the criteria was that individuals were recovered from COVID, but yet they were having this chronic fatigue. And the average age was about 52 years old. So they were offered a supplement, a food supplement. What this food supplement contained was vitamin C, acetyl L-carnitine, hydroxy tyrosol, which comes from extra virgin olive oil. It's a polyphenol, so it's an antioxidant. It contained vitamin B1, B6, folic acid, also known as B9, vitamin D, and also B12. Now, if a well-trained naturopathic physician like myself were to look at this um, amounts of these vitamins and supplements, we would say that these are pretty low doses. In particular, the vitamin D is only 0 0.025 milligrams. That equates to one international unit. We don't usually prescribe one international unit. So interestingly enough, after taking the supplement for 15 days, the supplement users reported an improved um, energy level, actually that doubled, and also it improved their psychological status to those that did not use the supplement. So although this is a very small study, and it did come from last year, it's just another indication that supplements can be our friends, even if it's a short-term use for post-COVID treatment. Some vitamins that I'd like to introduce to you for treating post-COVID that I believe are essential is vitamin D3 and vitamin C. So vitamin D3 is immunomodulating. Every single cell in our body needs vitamin D. And it's actually not a vitamin, it's a misnomer. It's a fat-soluble steroid hormone. Why? Because it comes from cholesterol, which most steroid hormones do. And all you need is the sun where it gets activated and goes through three special systems to actually induce what is the last active molecule known as cholic acetylcholine or vitamin D3. Vitamin D3 has great antimicrobial peptide properties, and it also can act on the adaptive immune system 
um, to lower the pro-inflammatory cytokines and control any kind of mediated responses that can come from specific T cells or T lymphocytes. In a systemic review published in 2021, uh, vitamin D that were low, for patients with low levels of vitamin D, there was a significant increased risk of ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome that required admission to the intensive care unit and mortality was driven by low vitamin D levels. And there was even a higher susceptibility to COVID-2 infection and related hospitalization. So vitamin D is key to having a good level status. And the best way to, to check is to do some blood work, see where your levels are at, and then know how to and how much of vitamin D supplementation you need, you need during the winter season. Moving on to vitamin C, this is a really great anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, free radical scavenging molecule that is called essential because we actually don't make it in our body. So we have to take or eat vitamin C through our food or our diet. It's a very inexpensive nutrient. And there's the literature on this, interestingly enough, when it comes to COVID cases, it's a bit controversial. So there was a study that was published that showed that there was no significant benefit to oral or IV administration of vitamin C in COVID-19 patients. They report that it didn't reduce mortality, ICU or hospital length stay, or the need for invasive mechanical ventilation. However, other studies have suggested that vitamin C has been included in at least 20 clinical studies to evaluate its efficacy in treating COVID-19 patients. And in those that are suffering from the respiratory viral infection component, it's noted that increased doses are required to show a more effective treatment. As a, so what we're looking at is six to eight grams per day versus three to four grams per day. So the fact that COVID has and its literature and its research has only been around for two years, um, there might just not be enough evidence or enough time to suggest what is the true consensus of vitamin C supplementation. And in fact, for those research um, studies that are implementing vitamin C assays, a lot of times it is noted that science is or scientists or uh, project management is trying to stay away from the assaying of vitamin C just because it is a very expensive assay to have. And so I just think that they're not able to do enough research, let alone not enough time. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to anti-inflammatory <clears throat> actions, I like to think about building an anti-inflammatory foundation when it comes to fats. So we get a lot of fats through our foods and eating an anti-inflammatory diet, we get a lot of omega-3 fatty acids. So I wanted to share with you what an omega-3 fatty acid is and why this is important. If you think about all cells in our body, cells, are, cells have a nice cell membrane and this is called a bilipid layer. As you can see, one is here and one is here. This is called a phospholipid. And why it's crucial to have anti-inflammation or omega-3 anti-inflammatory fats is because it presents unsaturated fat molecules that help the fluidity of the membrane instead of it being very locked and into place with saturated molecules. So an unsaturated bond allows the membrane to remain very fluid. And so different types of molecules can either come into the membrane or can be um, you know, excreted from the membrane. And so why we are really interested in this is because the essential fatty acids that are the acosinoids, EPA and DHA, they can exhibit anti-inflammatory properties that can reduce the cytokine synthesis and it can actually stimulate pro-resolving lipid mediators. These are molecules called protectins and resolvins. So if you can see here, if you change the membrane and you add anti-inflammatory fat, 
This can stimulate down, downward changes within the, in the cell, and this can actually inhibit these types of cell pathways that are related to inflammation, which is excellent. So if you can change one cell, you can change all of its connecting cells, which are our tissues. So it's kind of building from the ground up your foundation. Omega-3 supplementation has been noted in of last year in 2021 that it actually improved the levels of several parameters of those that were having respiratory and renal function issues in those that were critically ill of individuals undergoing COVID-19 infection. So this was really big key. And lastly, I'd like to offer some additional supplemental support. This one comes from FLCCC Alliance, and they do a really great job in kind of looking at the literature and coming up with well-versed well uh, treatment protocols for those that are actively undergoing COVID infection or new infection or long COVID. So they came up with this management protocol. It's called iRecover, and it describes first-line therapies, second-line therapies, third-line therapies, and also optional adjunctive therapies. And if you can see here on the list of anti-inflammatory actions, many of which we've actually discussed today, curcumin, vitamin C, melatonin, probiotics, behavioral management, mindfulness therapy, luteolin, and quercetin. And then we have also some medication use for reducing inflammation and histamine reactions. We can also see omega-3 fatty acids as a first line therapy and vitamin D status. So these are all key to helping to support this long-term COVID symptoms. And if anyone is interested in this four page report, please send me your information and I will get that over to you as soon as I can. I will take any questions that anyone has and thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you all feel very well. Yes, Annie. I thank you so much, Diana. That was a great presentation. You're welcome. Um, with all of the um, things that you discussed with like the supplements, if you take a pretty thorough multivitamin, do you still need to, to supplement with many of the things that you mentioned? Like I do those vitamin C packets that are like the, you know, so that you don't like get a cold or whatever. Um, I take those, it hasn't really helped me very much, but I do take those every day. But beyond that, I have a pretty, I do the multivitamin that's for women 50 and over. And I just don't, with all the different things you mentioned, I just don't know where to go next, like what else to add in. Yeah, I think you're doing a really great job. Um, you know, a lot of times we're taking multivitamins and we're thinking we're getting enough of the doses of these individualized nutrients. And I would recommend, you know, speaking to your healthcare provider and doing some lab testing to see you're taking these vitamins, you think that you're in good standing, and let's see if you're actually being provided these increased levels of these certain vitamins. So B12, folate, iron, you can look at other ingredients like iodine, magnesium, because these are all helpful for tissue repair. And when it comes to vitamin C, unfortunately, because it's water soluble, there's no specific test that I would recommend uh, that one would get their vitamin C level checked just because we pee it out if we're taking too much. And it's a really great way um, to provide antioxidants because if you think about it, the, those nutrients, if you're doing like divided doses, you're adding it to your bloodstream so that you're having the effects throughout the day rather than all one big lump sum. And if you have too much of it, your body will naturally excrete it and clear it from its kidneys. Um, and so even this, this vitamin C, I think what you're, what you're taking is very good, especially when dealing with like post COVID um, or prevention of COVID. And I probably wouldn't change that at all. It's a really great preventative nutrient. And going back to your multivitamin, just checking your levels, letting yourself know, is the multivitamin I'm taking sufficient enough? And the only way to check your levels is to do blood work. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I had a question about the pressure points and uh, how 
how long do you apply the pressure and how often would you need to do it? That just some guidelines on that. Sure. sure. Um, I'm very glad you asked that. I don't think I mentioned that. So I would say apply it for like a couple minutes, three minutes, five minutes. If you feel like you want to sit with that pressure point longer, just trust your body and do so. And how often? Uh, try it a few times a day, once a day, twice a day, up to three times a day. Just see, does it change anything? Does it change the symptom that you're feeling? And again, I will show it on myself because I'm not recording. So you'll find your nipples, you, you feel for the intercostal space, you'll find it right over here and you'll apply the pressure. And then when we do the kidney three, we're looking at personal, right? <laughs> okay, I can't really raise my leg that high, but I can share with you the stomach 36 point. <clears throat> you bend your knee, you find the eyes of the knee, you take your three, your uh, four, fingers together. This is called three soon. You find the outer portion or the lateral portion of the eye of the knee. You place it right against that. And then you measure right here, right at the very end. And then you're going to take one finger breadth of, away from your shin bone. And it's going to be located right there. So you're going to apply pressure. You're going to apply some massage and you're going to just stimulate that stomach 36 point. And if you feel like my my uh, description is not very good. Please just access the internet and you can look up the location of stomach 36. <laughs> and would you expect to see results like immediately or gradually or how? That's a good question. Um, I think it depends on the body. So if you're having um, like a nausea type of feeling, you would expect to see some kind of improvement. I think that a needle is a little bit more effective than the applied pressure because how much pressure I would put on versus how much pr a pressure you apply can vary. Um, it's worth a try. And if you can't necessarily get the relief you need, just come on in and community acupuncture will put that needle in and we'll see if you have any kind of positive effect. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? All right, guys, thank you so much for chiming in. Um, I will share my information with whoever is interested and I wish you a wonderful day. Keep up the good work and keeping yourself well and recovering post COVID. Until then. Thank you, thank Dr. You. Diana, we You're appreciate welcome. it. Okay, bye. Thank you so much.